with this fourth part of my lecture, we're going to look at two schools of thought that led up to modern psychology. And these are psychophysics and introspection. So in 1800, there wasn't a science of psychology. The term psychology was around and people were using it, but there wasn't a science of psychology. But by 1900, there was a science of psychology. So what changed? The final part of this lecture looks at the emergence of psychophysics and the broadening of psychophysical methods and, sub and subject matter into other forms of introspection and the birth of modern psychology. And along the way, we're going to look at the stars, lift some weights and examine our mental states. A very interesting period in Greenwich in astronomy um, came when they started measuring the times of stars as they crossed the sky. And this was really important for navigation as the ships of the British Empire were sailing around the world. They needed to know exactly where they were. And um, to do that, they needed to know exactly what the time was. And so in the Greenwich Royal Observatory, they'd, they'd look at the stars through their telescope. And here's a picture of a telescope, the crosshairs there. And they'd be lined up with the, the Greenwich Meridian, the sort of the middle of the sky. And each observer, each astronomer would look at, the sky, look at the stars in the sky and pick out a particular star. And then as the star approached the telescope's view and then started crossing the telescope as the Earth rotated, they'd be listening to a, a metronome, a series of clicks. And the job of the astronomer was to count how many clicks before the star crossed the meridian, so it got to the central line, to record the time that the star passed the central line. This all seems fairly straightforward, um, and various people did it, and, and because <clears throat> different astronomers did it slightly differently, and the Astronomer Royal at the time, in, in 1796, was Maskelyne, and he found that his student was um, pretty poor, and his, his student assistant kept getting the times wrong by about 0.8 seconds. And that's that's probably quite a lot. And, you know, if you're navigating around the globe and you get the time wrong every day by 0.8 seconds, you know, you, your your errors of localization could could add up. And I put wrong in quotes on this page because, well, there wasn't an objective time. There wasn't a correct time. So it all depended on the different observers looking through the telescope and counting the clicks as the star moved across the middle. And because this assistant got it wrong, uh, so often he, he sacked. He was sacked. And for 20 or 30 years, that was just, it was just assumed that was fine. Um, you know, some people come and go. But uh, Bessel in Germany studied the records of, of these astronomers and the problem and why it was that one researcher might get the time wrong by a second. And Bessel came up with the idea of a personal equation. And he found that individual people persistently got the wrong time or different times from another person. So over these 20 or 30 years, the importance of human observation of, of events, of lights and sounds in this case, was made really clear. And I think looking back, as we like to do, you can say that experimental psychology maybe began in the late 1800s and sorry, the late 1700s and the early 1800s, when the idea of individual differences in perception started being noted. And there's a really nice short paper by Mullen and Perkins from 25 years ago now, talking about this uh, case in the history of psychology and science. So over the 1800s, these sorts of problems with measurement and human perception were becoming more and more aware, or people were becoming more and more aware of these problems. Um, and various scientists started looking at their own perceptions. And psychophysics was born, essentially, in the mid-1800s, the early 1800s. And Ernst Weber began this work. And the aim of psychophysics is to find the mathematical laws that re relate psychic quantities and that's we've um, noted that with the Greek symbol psi for psych psychic or psychology to physical quantities, the Greek symbol phi 
so psychophysics, is to try and find a mathematical law that relates these two things, the psychological world and the physical world. And as I said, Weber began this work in the early 1800s, 1820, 1830, and then his student took it on and made a, made a sort of bigger thing of it a bit later on in the 1800s. It's the way Weber and Fechner went about this is by doing very simple, very, very simple things. For example, presenting a stimulus to a person and asking the person to estimate the magnitude of it, so the strength or the intensity or the size. Or they present something and they ask the subject to detect it or to discriminate between two things. Some key concepts that these psychophysicists came up with are, and we'll discuss these, uh, the two-point threshold, just noticeable difference, and psychophysical laws. And although this is almost 200 years old, this work, we are still using exactly these same methods and, and concepts in modern experimental psychology. So they really were critical and very useful methods. So here's Weber from a very clever, eminent family. But uh, this Weber brother, Ernst Weber, liked to spend his time between the University of Leipzig and hanging around on some lakes in the Alps. And he often went there with his family and his, his wife. Um, and Ernst would sit of an evening with his brother, lifting little weights and testing their powers of touch. And what they did is, is just over and over again, systematically and repeatedly testing themselves on the same very, very simple things, hundreds and thousands of times, Weber was able to formulate the first of the psychophysical laws, the laws, the mathematical laws that relate physical stimuli with psychological perceptions. And as I said, one of Weber's favourite hobbies, I suppose, was uh, lifting two weights, so maybe small weights like 20 grams and 30 grams, and he maybe had one in either hand and compared them simultaneously, or he lifted up a weight in one hand and then put it down and then lifted another one, or he even put little weights on different fingers or different other different body parts. And by systematically changing the weights in the two hands or in the two times, Weber found that there was a consistent threshold for each person and each condition. And the threshold he was talking about was the, the minimum difference in the two weights that was required before you start to feel that there is a difference. So it's a, it's a difference threshold. Um, you'll see um, Dr. Hannah Fry is up there. Um, she's a, a one of my favourite uh, scientific presenters on telly. But um, she's done a nice YouTube video on um, the method of psychophysics used by Weber and lifting weights. So I do recommend you watch that because it really puts it in um, puts it in context. So another of Weber's methods was um, looking at the perception of the separation of two points. So Weber and his brother would touch themselves on, on the skin with either one or two points of a compass, a blunt compass. It wasn't, it wasn't painful. Um, and in reading his work a few weeks ago, I realised there was literally no part of the body Weber did not explore with his compass points. And I, I do mean that seriously. There was not a single part of the body they didn't explore. And from these many, many thousands of investigations, Weber derived what he called the two-point threshold. And that was the minimum separation between these compass points that people would reliably port, report as their two points. So the job was to say, is it two or one? And when the, the points are brought very close together, People tend to say there's one point to not two. And they did this on all parts of the body. Um, and they found that when the, the two points are on the fingertip or on the lips, um, subjects could, could, recall, could, um, could report two point points when they were as close as one or two millimetres apart. But when they were on much less sensitive parts of the body, like the thigh or the, the upper arm or the shoulder or the back, then, then the points would need to be 40 or 50 millimetres apart before the subject recognises the two points. And surprisingly, this method is still used today. So 100, more than 150 years after it was in, invented, 
it's still used. But the problem, it does have serious flaws, psychological flaws, that weren't, weren't realised for another half a century or so. And it's a good um, sort of criticism of introspection in general, and we'll get on to introspection in a bit. But when you give people two points or one point on their skin, you're relying on the subject being reliably able to discriminate between one and two. That sounds quite fine when you think about it. It sounds, yeah, I know what two things feel like and I know what one thing feels like. But the problem is when they're not sure about whether it's one or two, um, they could go a number of ways. And they've got to know, they've got to decide how to discriminate, how to distinguish these two sensations. So a single point on the skin will almost always be described as one by most people, for example. But what about if you just slightly separate the points so that instead of a single point, you kind of get a, an elongated um, stimulus into the skin. So it's not really quite two because you can feel that there's some sort of elongation in the, in the stimulus. And so the problem is that people have to decide exactly what they're going to count as two and what they're going to count as one. And the two-point method may work very well for you know, Ernst and his brother sitting on an alpine lake uh, testing each other thousands and thousands of times. They're highly trained and they're you know, a really good psychophysical observer, we would call them. But when you take this method out into the real world with many individual differences and try and train people and try and get people to respond on this task, you, you actually get quite unreliable data. And that could be a criticism of introspection as a whole. But it is certainly a criticism of Weber's two-point method. So despite these problems, Weber has been an enormous influence on much psychophysics and particularly, particularly perception to this day. So the concept of the just noticeable difference, the minimum difference between two things before you can reliably tell them apart, that's still used today, the JND. The Weber fraction, which was his relative calculation of how large does something need to be before you can tell it apart from something else. The Weber fraction is still used. We still talk about Weber fractions. And in his early work, he also looked at many different bodily senses, so how the, how the bodily senses relate to each other, touch, proprioception and temperature. He realised there were two kinds of pain, a fast and a slow pain. You know, when you bang your foot, you feel a very quick fast pain and then the slow throbbing pain comes maybe a second or two later. He discovered a temperature weight illusion that cold things tend to feel heavier and he noted important individual differences in, in perception, in threshold and in their vapor fractions. And he noted and speculated about there being what we might now call receptive fields on the skin. He called them sensory circles, you know, discrete areas of skin that might be connected to different nerves in in the nervous system. So he was really quite modern in his approach to the study of tactile perception. So in Leipzig, Weber started the, um, the work on touch and Fechner was obviously greatly stimulated by Weber's work and he was his student and he, ex he greatly extended his experimental work. And more, more so, he tried to um, bind it up with a, a philosophical belief system as well. And and he, Fechner coined the word psychophysics in his book in 1860. And he, he thought of it as a discipline, a discipline for studying the relationship of the mind and the body. And he extended these, the experiments of Weber away from the body, also into sound, hearing and vision. Um, but it's interesting that he, he spent a lot of time staring at the sun, staring directly at the sun for um, minutes and hours and days. And um, he severely damaged his vision for for a long time and he spent almost three years you know, locked up inside because he couldn't bear going outside for the, the painful, the pain caused by his photophobia. When he recovered from these visual problems he, he set about creating this psychophysics uh, and looking for these psychophysical laws and he took Weber's law about the Weber fraction uh, and he improved upon it from turning it from a more linear law to like a logarithmic or an exponential law. So an exponential is something that grows more, much more quickly. As it gets larger, it grows even larger still, a bit like um, the spread of viruses. And this was Fechner's contribution that he refined and expanded Weber's initial experiments into psychophysical laws improved the mathematical descriptions of those laws, 
And he also expanded the methods, not only looking for different thresholds, but also for absolute thresholds, so how, how sensitive your sensory systems are. And the figure at the bottom of this page shows you some examples of absolute thresholds. So in vision, you can see a candle flame, a single candle flame 30 miles away, as long as it's dark. Hearing, you can hear a watch ticking 20 feet away. A drop of perfume, you can smell a single drop in a, in a six room house. A teaspoon of sugar in a gallon of water and the wing of a fly on your cheek. So these are the, the very smallest, lightest things you can detect in your five different senses. And it was the work of Fechner that really started this approach to psychology. And Fechner also noted that the differences between stimuli are, are not linear, as I mentioned before, but they're sort of multiplicative. So what I mean by that is, uh, imagine you're in a room and you turn on one light, it goes from very dark to quite light. And that's a huge change in illumination from very dark to quite light. But if you now turn on a second light, you might notice that the room is now brighter. You almost certainly you will, but it's, it's not twice as bright. Now physically there probably will be, you know, twice as much illumination coming out from these, these light bulbs as there was before. But it's not perceptually twice as bright. So Fechner noticed then that, that when you increase a physical intensity, it's not you don't necessarily get the same increase in the psychological or perceived intensity. In fact, there are these sort of logarithmic scales of perception that don't linearly linearly relate to the amount of stimulus. So to summarise the psychophysics of Weber and Fechner. It was sort of a link between natural philosophy and experimental psychology. It was a lawful, mathematical, physical way to understand the mind, the perception, human perception. And we talked about physiognomy and phrenology, and those things haven't had nearly as much influence on modern day psychology as has psychophysics. And they, in a sense, they were dead ends and they sort of come and go um, but they're not as nearly as productive as the psychophysical method began by Weber and Fechner. Now Fechner also tried to bundle in some uh, some philosophy in there. Um, he sort of he believed that all all things had souls, and it was kind of a Leibnizian view of of the soul. And that um, he that turned out to be not very good, and he was quickly rejected. And we don't remember Fechner for his for his philosophy anymore, but we certainly do remember them for their psychophysical methods. And it's also pretty critical that these two psychophysicists were working in Leipzig in Germany. And that's exactly where, only a few years later, the very first experimental psychology labs were set up. And this day in 1879, when Wilhelm Wundt sat down at his table with some friends and took this picture, um, this is widely regarded as the day that psychology was really born. And I think you can look back over the, the, the things, the things I've picked and plucked out of the out of the history of psychophysics and the world, and you can look at how you know astronomers failed to measure star transits accurately when they were trying to time lights and sounds relative to each other. And the, but the psychophysicists were really successful in describing many of the mental states that they had, the perceptions, with mathematical laws. And this must have encouraged Wundt only. 10, 20 years later, to set up his first psychological laboratory in 1879. And to reject all of the philosophical baggage um, of the past must have been quite freeing for these psychologists, because Fechner dropped his Leibnizian panpsychism, and he's not remembered for that philosophy anymore. And I don't think we remember the founders of psychology, Wundt and colleagues, for their philosophy. So in a sense, in essence, they could abandon much of this philosophy and just start again. And this gave them a great big to-do list, things to do over the next century or so. So consciousness can be measured, and much of philosophy has said that you can't measure consciousness, you can't, you know, you can't describe it, you can't record it. Uh, we could apply mathematical laws to these things. We can re-examine the claims of philosophy that they've made about the human mind. We can find out really how our perception of the world relates to 
the measurable world. And for good measure, let's also look at feelings, emotions, the will, and ideas. So these new psychologists had an awful lot ahead of them to do. And Wundt is often credited for the birth of psychology. He, he, was, he studied medicine and then physiology and physics and worked with some really great, great well-known scientists in the 1800s. But he's largely seen primarily as the, as the father of psychology now. His view was that the British Associationist School, um, you can think of it as Hume and the sort of the associations of ideas and the building up of, of, of mind by the association ideas. He rejected all of that and thought the mind wasn't simply a passive bundle of sensations. Instead, he preferred a much more active and creative mind, something that would perceive and, and, and exert its will on, on organising the world. So Wundt's psychology was called apperception, or voluntarism. And their study included the will and feelings and ideas, things that might have been purely philosophical concepts. Now, they did use experimental methods, much like the psychophysicists, you know, uh, electrical and uh, mechanical stimuli and response recording. But introspection was really critical to their approach, and that's about how they, how they perceive the world in its, in its essence. An example of Wundt's voluntarism, or about the will or volition, is that um, we voluntarily and actively decide what our mind does and what it attends to. And Wundt said that the mind is a creative, dynamic and volitional force. It should be understood through an analysis of its activity and its processes. Here's an example. So compare the act, the voluntary act of raising your arms with, with the, the more passive event that your arms are going up. Raising your arms implies that there's a volitional act, a conscious decision to move your arms. Whereas arms going up could be caused by something else, electrical stimulation of your brain, your arms could be lifted up by wire, or someone else could be raising your arms. So Wundt thought that the voluntary nature of mind was really critical to psychology. Another form of introspection was developed by Titchener's structural psychology. And in a way, he, he took it away slightly from this slightly more philosophical view of, of, um, of Wundt and aimed to, to build a sort of structure, uh, an atomistic view of the elements of psychology. And so his his approach was to break down consciousness into its into its elements. So you, you wouldn't just have touch anymore, but you'd have pressure, pain, tickle, warmth, hardness, dry, dryness, and smoothness. And he would try to combine all these elemental ideas to form more complex ideas. And this is a bit like Locke. And Titchener, who was born in, in England, must have been influenced by the, the English Associationist School of Philosophy and, and Experimental Science. And Titchener, Titchener also tried to explain how the nervous system might under, underlie all of this consciousness and uh, mental activity. With his introspective approach, and he had many students, and I think he probably had many of the first female students in his lab, um, if you look through his writings, there are, he, he often talks about the contribution of, of women. So although we've seen an awful lot of um, bearded white men in these lectures, Titchener's lab did have, definitely had um, several female uh, PhD students. So among them, among this great laboratory of, of PhD students, they came up with something like 44,000 elemental qualities of consciousness. And many of these were visual and much, much of the rest of them were auditory. And this, as you know, I'm interested in tactile perception in the body, and, and this is disappointing to me because much of psychophysics in the 1800s was on touch and tactile perception. But psychology was really homing in on vision and audition, and it's still very much biased by these, these two senses today. So Titchener's lab also used introspection, and this sort of atomistic introspection. Every single elemental quality of consciousness was, was inspected and written down and and recorded and, and added up. And this all seemed really quite productive. Uh, the problem was that different observers, different people would would have different introspections. And Titchener was supposed to be a bit of a bit of a dragon. Um, so he wouldn't really allow people, allow his students to um, to have the wrong the wrong perceptions. And um, so he had from from what I've read, he has very 
fixed ideas about what you should be feeling. And you might even sort of take whole chunks out of your thesis, your dissertation, because it didn't consist with his. So introspection, although it was a good idea, perhaps, um, it turned out that it's an unreliable method. People couldn't find the same images and same mental thoughts that other people had. Looking back at this time, going from psychophysics of touch primarily in the 1800s through vision and audition, and looking at the contributions of, of these four of these men, these these uh, mostly white <laughs> white bearded men, I think it's it's cause for celebration. We've gone from a purely philosoph philosophical through a natural philosophical into a modern psychology as we know today, and these these advances showed to the world of philosophers that you can study mental life experimentally. You can use the methods of psychophysics and introspection, and you can study the mind as if it was something like a physical or a chemical or a biological process, much as natural philosophy would, would have studied. But perhaps the good thing about this development in psychology is that we can actually get rid of much of the philosophical baggage baggage and just look again at the whole of human nature can we reassess everything that we know about the mind using psychological methods so from 1800 to 1900 psychology is now a thing and by 1900 all these four men on the left had written massive textbooks rather long rather dull some of them um, and they'd all set up psychological laboratories in Germany, in America, and soon in, in Britain and other parts of the world. So that's it for the first lecture. We've seen a lot of guys and uh, a couple of women contributing to the study of philosophy and psychology through the 1800s and 1900s. In the next few weeks, in the next week, we're going to be looking at how a parallel trend has uh, developed in terms of the relationship between humans and animals. So we're looking at evolution, evolutionary psychology, and going a little bit back to uh, physiognomy and, and looking at the idea of scientific racism in psychology. So do tune in next week. And if you have any co comments and questions, please make them on the forum as soon as you can.